lead yourself towards your goals. You want to help people and you want to benefit in the process, you need to lead yourself there. You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, Sarah Box. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners. Welcome back. This is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where as you know, we are on a mission to help individuals, teams, and organizations think outside of the box, move beyond limiting beliefs and labels, and create a profound impact in the lives of others, but not without losing ourselves and who we are and how we show up. And so, of course, we do this by sharing accomplished and inspiring guests who have done that in their own lives. And today is no different. We are honored to have Joanna Sapir join us. Now, Joanna is a, she has an interesting background mix. She is a seasoned business strategist, and she specializes in holistic practitioners who integrate multiple, multiple modalities into their work. So, you know, it's that whole cross section of things. But listen, she's a strategist. She's my gal. Um, in fact, she is on a mission to support holistic and multimodal practitioners so they can have a bigger impact on those they serve. Her unique talent lies in helping these practitioners establish efficient systems and processes that enhance client services, attract committed long term clients, and ensure a steady income and cash flow. She has over 20 years of experience as a teacher and trainer. She loves teaching. She has transi transitioned seamlessly from the classroom to the gym floor and now supports wellness practice worldwide. Hailing from the vibrant San Francisco Bay Area, Joanne is not only a dedicated mother of two, but also a USA Masters National Champion in Olympic style weightlifting. Hoo wee! And if that's not enough, she hosts the Business Revolution for Practitioners podcast. There's some alliteration going on there. And she values insights and strategies to revolutionize business practices in the holistic wellness industry. So today I'm going to ask Joanna to talk to us all about that concept of mastering client relationships in a holistic practice. But beyond just the holistic practice, how do we master those relationships in a meaningful way with whoever we serve, whether we call them clients or patients or whatever? But really, it's about sustaining authentic connections that go beyond transactions. And she is a champ with that. So with that, let's officially welcome Joanna Sapir to the podcast. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we get into the nuts and bolts of the podcast, um, I want to ask you um, to talk a little bit more about your interests outside of business strategy. You know, I noticed that you are reading Palo Alto, A History of California Capitalism in the World. So what, what drew you to this book? And have you found any interesting insights or connections from that work? to the work that you do while you were reading it? Oh my, I could kind of talk for the whole podcast about this. So I don't know if you want to go into that. Please do it. But, no, don't uh, be some connection. I mean, I, I am truly interested. It's an interesting okay. title. Well, my, um, in my former life, my, my formal teaching life, I was a high school history teacher. So just know I did that for a, a decade and that, you know, my heart is still in history, politics, culture, just as it is, is just as it is in business. And so uh, that book, I was so excited to f find it. It came out about a year ago. Um, I was born in Palo Alto at Stanford and um, uh, my parents were activists and in fact, their movements are mentioned in it. So that was a big draw, but it's this spanning history. It's a huge book, um, which I actually just finished last night. Um, and um, and it just really delves deep into the history of, as it says, capitalism and the world, but through the lens of 
the founding of early California, the founding of this town, Palo Alto, the founding of Stanford University and Silicon Valley, the development of Silicon Valley. So this question you asked, it's really interesting of, is it, is it offering me anything in my current work as a business strategist? And in fact, um, I, I, if you had, you know, if we had been doing this interview three weeks ago, two weeks ago, maybe I wouldn't have necessarily said so. It's like a side special interest of mine. Um, but towards the end of the book, yeah, there's a, there's a strong, um, there's a deep dive into Silicon Valley since the seventies and the massive impact it's had on labor practices across the world. And particularly the transition to contracting out labor rather than using employees and, and you know, this book's position is what a negative overall impact that's had um, on traditional companies. Not It's not looking at small businesses like I work with, um, but how that's affected uh, all of us. And um, so that that's very related, um, especially because I, you know, I work with practitioners and help them do hiring and managing staff. And it's a real thing. And they want to do it differently than large corporations do. They don't, you know, just as you're talking about authentic client relationships, they want authentic, meaningful relationships with their staff if they have one. So. Yeah. So what are some of the ways that um, you you see the folks you work with want authentic client relationships? There are some words that get, we all throw them out, but they mean slightly different things depending on who's sharing them, right? So for your clients who are in smaller practices where they would have teams, right? I'm assuming they're somewhat smaller if they're not huge. Yeah, I would, most of the people I work with are solo practitioners, okay. but I, maybe 25 to 30% are uh, have a staff, yeah. So what are, when they're talking about how they wanna work differently than the past, um, what are some of the key things that they want to integrate into how they work? Experience with their clients? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So um, I, people are drawn to working with me because I talk about this and what they tell me they experience most of all. Here's, here's how I'd like to frame this. We think, especially so this will be everyone listening, I assume, all the people you talk to, which is we get into providing services of some sort and we're doing it for totally meaningful reasons. We want to help people, right? In whatever the ways that we help people are. That's what we're, that's why we started the business or got into this work. We did not get into it going like, I'm starting some business and I'm going to be a millionaire, right? Like that is not our intentions. We're here to serve and we're like, I want to make a living out of this. Like, I think I can make a living out of this, but my primary motivation is to help people. And because we come in with that, a lot of times business stuff, marketing, sales, that kind of stuff, that actually feels you know, kind of yucky, transactional, like that's just this businessy stuff, but that's not really why I'm here. And so the fascinating thing is that when we treat business stuff that way, what I see is that we actually become more transactional. It's like, it like becomes our shadow or something like we don't want to deal with it or we don't know how. And so we actually become very, um, yeah, transactional, I just said, I'll just give an example. I call it the freelancer trap. And this is like a symptom, I'd say, of of not wanting to deal with business stuff. And and the amazing thing is it it hurts you and it hurts your clients when you're like this. And it hurts those relationships with them. So the freelancer trap, I call that when you think that you're, so I work with wellness practitioners, right? So let's just say it's a, you know, a massage therapist, body worker. Let's just make that, choose that. And when a prospective client, you know, contacts them, they're in this mode of like, yeah, you just take anybody that you can get. And it's like, when we're in the session is when I will try to like, wow them and, you know, hope that they like what they get and, um, you know, and then hope that they rebook another session. And, and again, this is what I call the freelancer trap. Like you think that like, it's just make that transaction and that's how this is supposed to work. 
And then when they do come in, that's what you do. You actually feel like I'm just here to like make them happy. That's all I'm here to do. I just want them to be happy. So they'll rebook another session. So it's almost like you're training your client to actually see you as this freelancer. Like uh, since I gave the example of a massage therapist or body worker, a freelancer trap is somebody comes to you and you say, what would you like? What would you like? What this kind of massage or that kind of massage? What would you like for me to do, do for you today? Whereas like this massage therapist is the one with like actual training. They know how to assess somebody's problems. They know how to actually like provide the treatment. They know how to find what the actual cause is rather than just try to make you feel better right now. Right. And so they're on this, this freelancer trap of, okay, just make them happy and just give them what they want. Ask them what they want. Give them what they want. Ask them to rebook. Hope they do. Right. And so I come at this from uh, like, let's flip that around quite a bit and get out of the freelancer trap and recognize that you are, you as a practitioner are some kind of, I guess, expert could scare people, but you have had training and experience. Like you are the one that has the skills that the client does not. Mm. The client does not know. The client might know my shoulder hurts, my hip hurts, but they don't know what's going on. They may have gone to a doctor and gotten some type, some kind of diagnosis. That's still not a treatment. They don't know what their treatment plan is, right? And that's what they're coming to you for. And if you act like a freelancer, they're just going to treat you like a freelancer. But if you actually step into leadership and have a process where you invite them in and you say, let's look at what's going on. Let's do an assessment. You assess them and you lay out a treatment plan for them. In this case, this could be a coach too. It doesn't have to be a treatment plan. It could be all kinds of things, right? But lay out what the plan is for them and enroll them in that, get their buy-in for the plan because that's actually gonna get them the results they want. You get out of that freelancer trap and out of that transactional relationship. You're now building a relationship with somebody and you're actually getting their commitment and getting a long-term client and higher income in the process, right? So it's like this natural result is actually better business when you stop thinking that business is transactional because business, done right, can meet your client's needs, get them the results they want, get you committed clients and provide you steady income with that. It's Yeah. And I, I think that's so powerful, Joanna, because I know oftentimes people will think you do one thing. So, um, and I love your example of a massage therapist because I don't say anymore, like, so what what's going on with you? I says, okay, here's what I know. When you ask me what's going on with me, I'm going to tell you, where I'm experiencing it, but I know that's not the problem. So I'm yeah. just going to let you figure it out because you know, you know, I yes. mean, honestly, their hands will tell them their training and all of that. But when I learned to quit asking for something, I got better. I got better things because they're going, oh yeah, this is what this person needs. Right. And they do that. And they're not worrying if I, is it Swedish? Is it this? Or is it that? It's like, do what you need to do. Yes. Just don't hurt me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, and that's the same even in my business. People think I need a plan or I need this. And it's like, well, let's talk about what's going on. Exactly. Because you're, you, you're going to assess that. Yeah. You may not need that. You may need something much smaller or whatever. Um, the other thing is you're not seeing, I and I, whether I'm the consumer or the provider, I'm not being felt like I'm a commodity, you know, like this service is just a commodity. You could go buy another one at a different place, identical, but it really is. It's, it is about a relationship, which feels so much more valuing. Do you think that having that mindset going in just even in and of itself, before you do a service with your practitioners as practitioners, do you think that influences the outcome just because your intention is clearer? Which outcome are you asking? So about? say let's go. Let's keep with our ma mythical massage therapist. Okay. Right? If their intention is for a long-term relationship with this yes. new client, right? Yes. Is that intention just holding that intention? Does that help them from the get-go have 
and help them and their client have better outcomes rather than I want six months of this client because I have a great enrollment plan? Um, this is an interesting question. Um, and this is where I think like making friends with business practices, like learning business and actually learning the skills is really important. Yes, the intention energetically, fantastic. It's a start. But sometimes that intention, I mean, I think this, you you started by asking me, you know, what happens with people or or what I remember hearing was, you know, why do people come to you? I just had somebody come to me, for example, an acupuncturist who was like, I looked at the data of my last six months and I've had, you know, dozens, I can't remember the number, you know, 35 first time clients and none of them have rebooked, right? So that's a real thing is like clients that come in once and drop off. It's more than just intention. But the thing is too, if your intention is for that, but there's this desperation there, I do think energetically that's going to screw everything up, right? Especially if that desperation is based on finances and which is so normal, like we all go through that. So you got to come in from an empowered stance and, a, and, I mean, this is the work that I do. So of course I like believe in it, but it's like, learn how to do it right. Learn how to do it right. The way I do it just to say is actually like teaching people a sales process, which, you know, sales just sounds so, it sounds so transactional and businessy and yucky to people. And yet it is actually the key to building these really authentic long-term relationships with your clients. So it's like, again, stop shoving it aside, the business stuff into the shadows and not looking at it, right? And bring it forward and like, let's dive in and actually look at how you can have the kind of relationships with clients that you want. So sure, it starts with intention, um, but it, I mean, I've seen it take more, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and have, I mean, that's an interesting thing about sales because people feel weird about it. But I think my relationships with sales changed when I realized that without them, people aren't going to get what they want, you know? And so it's it really is like, um, I don't think about it like, here, buy this today. It's like, exactly. let's see what's going on. Here's some options, what'll fit you. But more of a discovery and not in the, just to get the discovery done, but to really think, okay, what would serve this person? But not to just think, well, if they say not yet, it doesn't mean not ever. Oh yeah, yeah. I think probably when people hear the word sales, they think that that's some kind of pitch and pushy thing. I mean, the experiences we often have is like what, you know, I think of like going to the appliance store and somebody's trying to sell me a particular washer and they're like, in my face being like, this one has this and this and this and this and this and this, and you should get this one or whatever. You know, people talk about a used car salesman or something like just to point out, probably you've been through a sales process at some point that you didn't even think of as a sales process because it was just so lovely and smooth and you got what you needed, you know, and, but that is a sales process. So all I mean by sales or sales process is what's the repeatable step-by-step -step process from the time that somebody reaches out in some way to contact you interested in your services and from that point on what is the repeatable step-by-step -step process you have for every single prospect that is um that is helping them and i think about it as a series of stepping stones so it's not just like a one-time thing you're you're building that relationship with the stepping stones and i also will just use this opportunity to note that up to that point where they contact you, I call that part marketing. So there is a difference between marketing and sales. And that's another thing because it's that business stuff that people don't want to think about. They mash it together, right? And so they think like marketing and sales is the same thing. And they actually try to sell in their marketing, which is really salesy and gimmicky, right? Where they, you know, let's say it's a social media post or an email and they're like, buy my thing, buy my thing. And of course that feels yucky. It's just like not not how that's not building a relationship in any way right so um so marketing is one thing sales is another but from that point that somebody reaches out to you you know whether it's a phone call or a contact form through the website or whatever so can you give us an example imagine a real practitioner not our mythical massage okay. someone that you've worked with who kind of went through the process with you and is on the other side and, and having great results as a 
because of that work. Yeah. What were the stepping stones? Um, what were their stepping stones and the points at which they kind of got those aha breakthroughs? Yeah, um, I have so many. I'm going to look at my list here just to try to choose one person. Um, okay, sure. I got, I got, so this is a, a woman who is a, she's like a movement and fit kind of fitness, but movement, um, coach, um, works with, uh, women, women and, um, often who have injuries, active women who have injuries. And part of the work she does is helping them rehabilitate injuries and prevent them into the future through particular movement, you know, fixing their movement patterns really is what it is. Um, so when she came to me, she, um, she had kind of a very small scale business, you know, was very, um, low key and, um, and she was teaching classes that were drop-in classes for like $15 each. She rented a little, um, you know, room at some kind of studio. I think it was a chiropractor's office or a yoga studio or something. And, you know, so she would run these classes twice a week and like whether people showed up or not, she had no idea whether they would. Sometimes there'd be two people, which like didn't even cover the cost of renting the room. Right. So totally kind of unpredictable, but that's what people think they should be doing. And then she had some one-on-one -on -one clients where she would go to their house and those were longer term relationships that were, that she enjoyed. So I led her through this process. What did you ask me? The big ahas. Yeah. So. Well, the stepping stones, like, we're, so that's a great example, right? Um, so what were some of the first steps or the stepping stones and her aha moments or shifts in how she applied what she was being taught by you? Yeah. Well, I'll just go through the steps that I took her through. And so um, the first thing I did with her, uh, which doesn't sound very like sexy or applicable, but you, you, Sarah, will appreciate is that we, uh, I helped her declare sort of the core ideology of her business. What was the purpose of her business and what are her core values, um, which nobody really does. They all think they kind of have that, but it's like, yeah, this isn't yours personally. It's like, what's this business about? Why does it exist? What is it meant to do? A um, little different than a mission statement to me. So, but these are all these foundations that I build. So that's where I started with her. And then next we started looking at who are your ideal clients? So, you know, looking back at the past, this isn't like making it up, right? It's like, who have you really loved working with? and that saw the best results from your services. So like what, combine those, like what do we have or what kind of patterns do we have and see who our people are. So that's super key is knowing who your people are. I call them your bullseye clients. Um, and then from there, the, the, her, her, what she talks about is this, this was her big aha was we created a visual framework that explained the work that she does because even when i was just introducing her i was like fitness movement i don't i don't have her language that i helped her develop but you know it's not fitness and it's not it's not uh physical therapy it's you know it's this combination of modalities and so we create a visual framework that lays out what that work is who it's for and what are the results it gets and that visual framework ends up being i mean has ended up being this it's both a rooting kind of grounding piece for for her as a practitioner, like she knows how to talk about her work and refer to it that way. And then it's also a fantastic marketing tool because now she teaches her framework in free workshops. And that's actually how she gets new leads and clients is, is through that or first step in getting new leads and clients. So that framework was a big, big aha for her. And from there, we developed her first program. And so uh, one of my kind of hallmarks or things, I say, stop selling sessions and start creating programs, right? So this is that idea of a treatment plan. And this is different. If we talk back to our, our hypothetical um, or our mythical <laughs> massage therapist, you know, a long-term program or long-term services is not about a pack of sessions. Usually like you know, practitioners will sell a pack of sessions at a discount. And again, this is back to that, 
that thing I was saying about just transactional, right? Like you think that that is, I mean, they're selling it just to like get more money. You get a discount if you spend more upfront. Like it's just totally not about, no, what's the plan? What's the service going to be? Where am I going to be at the end? What are the stages to that? What are the steps I need to take or we're going to take together? And so that's what we develop is the actual program. What's the actual plan for these bullseye clients, for these ideal people for you? What is it that they really need to get the results that they want? And and then uh, so that's also just incredibly uh, has been really liberating for her and all the folks that I work with. It's exciting if you can imagine, right, if you know that you can help people. And you're regularly getting new clients that you're not getting a chance to actually get to their results, get to the end because you're relying on them just booking another session, right? Or you're arbitrarily yeah. selling these arbitrary number pack of sessions. Um, it's such a joy to actually carry people through a process that you've designed and that is really getting them those results. And so from there, now we have kind of all these foundations built. And then I, and then I taught her how to, how, how to build, how to have a sales process. And I kind of lead her into like building that step-by-step and the, and the crux of the sales process, the, the heart of it is a consultation and that consultation is free. And um, just like I was saying before, it's not a pitch. They're not pitching. I mean, the way I do consultations and teach them is there's no pitching involved at all. Like if you come to a consultation with me, Sarah, we're talking about you, right? We're talking about you, what's going on with you. How's that feeling? What are the, what are the problems I, you see? What are your goals? And what's that gap? What's that gap between where you are and your goals? And if, uh, you know, I, in my program can help you bridge that gap and get you there, I can let you know that. And I may not be able to, right. And I'll let you know that as well. And, um, and so that's what practitioners that work with me in this one, I'm talking about movement, fitness, you know, she has this sales process now. And so she does these really simple free workshops, invites people to either just join her email list or book a consultation with her. This is all free, you know, and, um, and if they, you know, get on her email list, they get all kinds of good stuff. And then if they book the consultation with her, she's got this really clear process that again, is all about that prospective client and, and her, the practitioner really doing an assessment and determining, is this somebody I can truly help? Is my program the right fit for for this client, for this prospective client? And if so, it's just very natural to, to enroll the person in that. And I, I don't think people remember it's a conversation. Oh, that's exactly so what We have those all the time. Yes. Okay. It's a conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, I think people really, really like for anybody listening, if you're a service-based business and you have never been taught some way to do consultations, like learn <laughs> because we can go in and wing it with things, but there are all kinds of issues to wing in it. I mean, first of all, if you're not having conversations at all with people, start having conversations with people, hundred percent, right? Like, but most people have some kind of conversation, but they'll do something like some people, for example, will come to me and they already have on their website, like a 15 minute consultation. And so I just ask like, how do those go? Like, what do you, what do you do in 15 minutes? Like, is that enough or, you know, and, um, and, and so, so I teach a process that's in depth, you know, and it really is, uh, it, it, there's an interview involved and it's you interviewing the prospective client, you know, and learning all about them. And again, determining whether you can help them and what exactly they need so that you're laying out their plan for them right there in the consultation. That's the best. I mean, for me, it's one of the most fruitful conversations to have with folks because they'll say, well, this is what I want and this is what I need and this is what's been happening. And just by letting folks talk and having some great questions, oftentimes you come to a different approach together. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're not the right person, it's a great a, it's a great confidence builder to say, you know what, I hear what you're saying. I'd like to refer you somewhere else because that's not what I focus on, you know, Exactly. Um, because who wants to show up and say, I can do that. And then feel like you're just basically an imposter throughout. 
Exactly. Yeah. I call it kindly referring them elsewhere. Yes. And it's something we actually celebrate in, in my work with clients. We they people will celebrate the first time they kindly referred someone elsewhere because it feels so good because, uh, that freelancer trap in that freelancer trap, you take whoever shows up in that freelancer trap. You're like, that's what I'm supposed to do is take anybody. Somebody's come in and wants to pay me and wants to do it. Yeah. I take them and no, <laughs> Don't want, do it. yeah, right. We want your ideal clients, you know? And it, I always think about it is if you take, in that instance, take on someone who's not your client or someone you've worked with before, but they're not committed to their own journey with you. Um, you are, because you've sold your time and time with them, someone else who really needs you can't have you. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like just, if even if you're nervous, kindly refer them. Yes, yes. It's a great reason to have a referral network too, to have other people like in your field that you know, our friends, uh, people that you know, that, you, you know, are doing good work. It's, it's great. It's a big relief, honestly, because then it makes you feel like a big, big team because you know, people, you know them, you trust them and you can refer them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's super. Um, I want to ask you to shift gears for a minute um, and talk about what the common pitfalls are for holistic practitioners. And I'm going to say to my nonprofit leaders, this is you also, because we are very similar when it comes to business. The legal structure might have a different name, but the processes and practices behind the scenes are business practices. So what are some of the common pitfalls that we might not have talked about right now when it comes to business management and how your practitioners overcome them? Yeah. I, I think I have mentioned some of the really key ones uh, that come out of that freelancer mindset of number one, taking anyone who comes along your way, you know, and not, it really is putting you in a position that, that of, of not being a leader, right? It's like, when you do that, you're not being a leader. You want to lead your business, lead your clients, lead yourself towards your goals. You want to help people and you want to benefit in the process. You need to lead yourself there. Um, so that's, that's big. There's little things, like I was saying, kind of thinking that like selling in your marketing, um, which I just really, like I said, I call that selling to strangers really don't advise doing that. Like buy this, buy this, buy this instead, invite them to something to the, to some kind of conversation where they can get to know you in some way. Um, I, I, I know that I, I know that that question was written off something where I actually had these three, but I'm kind of spitballing right now, um, particularly in sales process, but there are little things, big picture in terms of a business. One of the reasons that I started with the purpose and values with who I was talking about is that, um, there are folks, I mean, I've worked with people who have been in business 20 years and they come to me and they still like don't have a separate business bank account um, than their personal, which, you know, blows me away. Like no shame or judgment for anybody listening, but that's the case. But I think about that energetically as, I mean, besides that it's really not kosher, like books wise and tax wise and all that. I don't, your, your accountant probably doesn't, isn't very happy about it, but energetically, I want to see anyone running a business or nonprofit, seeing it as a separate entity. It is not you. It is an entity and you are the leader of that business. It's not you, you are you, right? Even if you're the only person running it, you're the only person in it. You are a human. This is a business entity or some kind of legal entity, right? Separate those things, separate those things. And then know I am the leader of this. It's my job to like step into the leadership of taking this to, to where I want it to go or for it to be what I want it to be. I think that's probably the most important one. <laughs> Having the whole leader concept and the separating the business from the self. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, it goes beyond just the bank accounts, but yes, like, oh, absolutely. like saying, energetically, just in all ways and, and understanding that a, a lot Unless of. Unless you keep your boundaries too. Yes. So yes. that you're not like, oh, I'm available when you're, you shouldn't be because you're burnt, you're tired. You need to like be your person where your business takes a nap until you're back. Yes. Um, that's a huge issue in, in my in my, with the people I work with <laughs> who often give their cell phone numbers, their personal cell phone numbers is uh, as their business number and clients can text them and clients can text them in desperation. Um, and they feel like uh, this is again, a freelancer mindset. They feel like they need to respond or they need to come in on off hours to see somebody. Um, and, and I would call that not leading, right? Um, any sort of like program or treatment plan, whatever the field, whether we're talking about coaching, acupuncture, um, you know, whatever, whatever it is, do look, well, that's not a good one. Uh, I I'm just looking at my list. Yeah. They're, doula won't work because they're yeah, on that one. They are on call. They are actually on call. I'm actually looking at my, my list of clients in front of me, I'm looking at and their services, but that's part of, part of their service. Right. But, um, leaving yourself to that is to me like not stepping into leadership right and if your clients expect that it is a hundred percent because you have built in that expectation like you that's you you have made made that like a normal thing um by responding to people on off hours and right and that's what they learn to expect so one of the first things i do with my busy clients is, um, well, I call it creative values aligned schedule. And so instead of uh, being open everywhere, it's actually them kind of creating line, creating their own boundaries. But it's not about, you know, a lot of times people feel like boundaries is mean and leaving people out. It's actually just starting with you. What are the hours that you want to be working? What are the hours that you are available to clients? What are the hours you want to be working out? What are the hours you want to be with your partner or family or friends what you know where's this all go and then actually like putting the structures in place in your business where all that's there and there's simple ways to do that like with automated scheduling automated if if you teach your clients that this is how you this is how you book an appointment this is how you communicate with me guess what they'll do it <laughs> Yeah. They will do it, but you've taught them if they're texting you, they're texting you to book a session. If they're texting you for an emergency, they want to be seen. You've taught them to do that, you know? Yeah. And I, I've, uh, I know right coming out of the pandemic, that was a big deal for many of my clients because they'd been working online. Well, actually shortly after they went into it as well, but because they didn't have to drive to an office. They go, well, I'm really not doing anything. I can be available. And I said, no, because I'm I'm having meetings with them at like 1130 or 12 and in the day. And I'm looking, you look like you've been up for hours. Oh, my God. Yeah, I got I've got coffee, got on Zoom at 630. I go, why? They wouldn't have done that before, you know? Yeah. Well, I was I felt guilty. I, ha you know, I'm going, OK, let's work on that. Right. Right. Let's work on that. Right. Um, because you'll burn yourself out. And the similar kind of thing, it's like, okay, just when do you really want to be available? Just, just, just don't. So when someone says, can I talk to you at seven? Just say, I'm not available until X, Y, Z time. I'd love to schedule with you after that. What works for you? Oh, well, that's awkward. I go, it's only going to be awkward the first time. And I guarantee you, people will not push back on you because they don't want you calling them at weird hours either. Um, but it's that getting in the, practice of it. Yes. Yeah. I heard you say something on another podcast. Um, I, I, maybe I won't remember the exact words right now, but you said something about it's only uncomfortable until it's not or something, you know? Absolutely. It's, and then it's, it's like normal. Yes, exactly. And then it's normal. And then you can't believe how you were before. It's, it's, you know, everything's new right at first and then you get comfortable with it and then it's just fine. Well, and, you know, when you work across multiple time zones, I mean, I try to be flexible, but there are, to like you say, when do uh, the times you want to be available? It's like, I know it's really convenient for someone on the East Coast to want to talk at nine in the morning, but that's 6 a.m. for me. No, thank you. 
Let's let's find a compromise because I'm not going to be any good for you. Um, Not in the way that I want to show up for my clients. Yeah. So I really, and I, I am a big believer in boundaries and we do tell ourselves stories about being mean, but I think being clear with people is the kindest thing you can do because otherwise they're trying to figure you out like mind reading. Well, does Joanna really mean I can do that? And it's like, just be clear. Oh, totally. I I mean, uh, I think about it as it's like you're actually making the guardrails and they will step right into them when you set those expectations. It's not an issue. The only time it's an issue, first of all, if somebody knew, if you have these kind of boundaries around your time and somebody new is like challenging you on it, that's a real sign. Like that's not that's not somebody you necessarily want to work whoa, with, whoa, right? Whoa. Red sign. Yeah. Red yes, flag. exactly. <laughs> So it's like switching your existing or old clients into kind of new boundaries. That's the only challenge. Anybody new, they just step right into line because like you said, it's kind and it's clear to them. Oh, this is how this works. Oh, this is how this works. And I got to bring that back actually to the sales process. Same thing. Yes. That's what it is. It's a step-by-step process and you know what you're doing and you're leading them through it. And it's so clear to them. They go, oh, great. This is the next step. Oh, okay. Relaxing, this is the right? next step. They can just be calm about it. Exactly. It is really, really beneficial for all. And yes, it's the opposite of the anxiety that that you think that you know that practitioners think. Like if I do this, that what did you say? Um, guilty or whatever. It's yeah. like the opposite. Like that is just not an issue. It's not an issue. Yeah, I, I can't imagine telling any of my professional like the doctor, somebody's like, Hey, I know you don't see patients on Friday, but really I'm special. Right. He says, good. Call the office on Monday. We'll see what exactly. we can do. Or exactly. go to the hospital. Exactly. Exactly. We don't question it when we just know this is how it works. Yeah. And if you consider yourself a professional and you mentioned like, you don't know if you'd say expert, I actually do think practitioners because of their training, they're definitely more expert than I am. Oh, they are a hundred percent experts. I work with so many and I'm blown away by, you know, some of them like massive amounts of like schooling and very scientific schooling, you know, I have a lot of acupuncturists and other people, but I was only noting that sometimes people themselves are like, I'm not an expert. And it's like, oh, you are. (laughs) I know you are. I know you are. And I think that's a great reason for working with someone such as yourself though, because you're external. You can see that you can like, okay, here are the steps. Um, and we're not going to question whether you're an expert. This is just the business process. Yeah. And it, I think I, I'm a big believer in working with guidance, coaches, all of that. Me too. Because there's no reason to feel lost in the woods. There's yeah. people who know, people who know. Absolutely. Um, so what is, um, we talk a little bit about like your weightlifting. Sure. <laughs> I don't mean to turn left on you, but I'm so fascinated because I just am. That's just yeah. me. Well, it's actually a significant, you know, part of my life story and a significant piece of my life still. Um, I, in a nutshell, we'll just say uh, in my, how old was I? About 30 years old. I had my second son. I have two sons and uh, and I had a very traumatic birth and I really suffered. I had PTSD and it was a big, big thing. And as I was uh, probably about a year after he was born, I um, decided to go like, I don't know, get in shape. I had never been a gym goer. I had actually been an athlete my whole life, but never like a gym person. Um, And I happened to find my way to a little community of strength training people. And was introduced to to uh, strength training and and weights and barbells, and it absolutely changed my life. I mean, it just completely changed my life. Coming out of like a you know a shock trauma, it um, it changed my entire mental outlook. I mean, I was physically getting stronger, but it was making me mentally and emotionally stronger as well. And um, And it's what led me, I I ended up like 
selling my home and leaving my career and moving to a new county with my two two little boys um, to start a new life. And that's actually how I ended up in uh, in entrepreneurship at all. I had been a public high school teacher. I'd not something I'd ever anticipated. I never had like visions of being an entrepreneur or anything like that. And I ended up uh, I ended up opening a strength and conditioning gym. And during all this time, I found the sport of Olympic style weightlifting, which is called that because it's in the Olympics. In the rest of the world, it's a big sport in in much of the world, particularly like. Uh, China and Russia, Eastern Europe, kind of for, former, former, uh, you know, it's kind of second world communist countries. Um, but it's also all over the world. And, uh, um, and so I found my way to the sport. I started competing right away. Turned out I was good at it, but I was already um, at an age. I was already 35 and that's considered master's level, which is the older folks. It's everybody over 35. <laughs> <laughs> it's shocking when you go, but I'm just in my thirties. Yeah, you're a master's. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, so uh, yeah. So I've done it ever since. It is just a really regular part of my life. It's also, um, it's such a special. It's grown. The, the sport in the U.S. has grown tremendously just in the time I've been in it. Um, and and there's a real there's a great community it's a you know it's not a team sport though like at the olympics level or national or uh, international level there are country teams um but it is a sport that even though you're solo and individual um there's still a team aspect to it in that everybody's cheering for you like every you it's you against a barbell it's you and a barbell and everybody knows what it's like that does it so you're just there to support everyone um and yeah it's a it's a really important part of my life yeah how has seeing their mom do that um changed your boys and their view of you yeah it's funny i think that their entire memory of me is you know like this uh, is is doing this so they don't it it hasn't changed anything. It's just, I always have, it's more like how it's impacted them. They both are very athletic themselves, but it's kind of like that was mom's thing and they had no interest. Do you know, I tried to get them into both, both of them. Um, one of them competed a few times as a really little, he was like nine or something, you know, and, um, they both tried it and, uh, and didn't go for it. <laughs> Not their thing. Not their thing. Yeah. So um, I, it's a good question what they think of me. I think it's just so part of things that they don't even think about it much, you know? Yeah. Um, How old are they now? So my sons are 19 and 22. They'll think about it. Yeah. They will. I just think about the things I didn't think about that were utterly remarkable about my mother. I just, because she's my mom, you know, that's just, that isn't that how they are and then you get up and you look at the world and you go on that's not the norm right almost remarkable so i that's why i asked that question because you just that kind of dedication over time to something yeah. like that is in itself a message yeah yeah about perseverance and showing up for yourself and celebrating others which is kind of what you do in your business yeah yeah you have a good crew you have a good congruent through line to what you do. Yeah. Yeah. How you show up. Thank you. Um, I would like to leave for you an opportunity to um, talk to people about the best way to find you, come learn more about you, let you learn more about them. What's your preference for that? Um, well, my website is joannasapir.com. I imagine you'll have links there. And there are free resources available on my website for anyone who's a, a, a health or wellness practitioner um, and has a business. There's, um, and I think, did we give you a, did we give you a free, did we give you a link to the, the client champion class? formula? Yeah. So that we have the, we have a masterclass from me that is the client champion formula. And that is my whole framework for how to get long-term clients, create steady, predictable income and build a resilient wellness practice. Um, and that really outlines everything, like all the pieces. Um, 
in, in detail. So that's a really, for, for anyone who's listening, who wants to see like, yes, that's what I want is a resilient wellness practice with long-term clients and steady income. That's a really good one. And then I'll also just mention that I have a podcast, as you said, at the top of the show, um, the business revolution for practitioners, and that's got some juicy stuff in there. That that's awesome. Um, I do like that um, the client champion formula. So I'm encouraging folks, wellness or not. Well, I'm encouraging the wellness practitioners because I think that's so important. You know, we don't want to go to get our health and supports when we're in critical need. And if you have a wellness practitioner in the name wellness, you know, we can help ourselves be the leaders of our own lives to to reach for and maintain our health and and wellness um, with some really expert people who care about that alongside of us. Yeah. So I want all your practitioners to be successful from a very selfish point of view, because I want to be in business so that I can benefit from them. That's right. It's so much better for us as clients. I'm, I'm glad you're just ending with that because this is really about serving people more deeply and more powerfully and better. Yes. And for long term. Yeah. So, all right, Joanna, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I know it's actually delivered a lot of value to our community of listeners. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic business coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. Please remember to rate, leave a five-star review, and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Till next time. Keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.